Batman the Animated Series is quite possibly the most definitive version of the character that has ever been created. The series ran a total of 85 episodes and it began its life over on Fox Kids in 1992. Eventually, it would make its way over to Kids WB and would see a myriad of spin-offs that would become known as the DC Animated Universe, long before the idea of a shared universe would take hold in the MCU. The animated series not only opened up the doors to a shared DC universe, but it also introduced characters and concepts that would be adapted into mainstream comics. But how did this iconic show begin, though? What made it the hit that it was? Let's take a brief look at the history surrounding one of the best animated series of all time. It was 1990, and the TV-watching audience really only knew one Batman at this time. Batman starring Adam West and Burt Ward had run through 1966 until 1968. While this show was incredibly popular, it was more campy, and it was a comedic version of the Batman character, mirroring some of the more wacky adventures of the Silver Age comic books. Children also knew of Batman and Robin from the Super Friends, which ran from 1973 until 1985. These versions of the characters also showed the more campy and kid-friendly versions of our favorite heroes. Not the darker tones from Batman's origins, which he had returned to in the 80s. When Tim Burton's vision of the Dark Knight debuted in movie theaters, all of this changed. While some look at the films as dated and campy now, those films returned Batman to an image of a grim protector of a gothic city. It was the popularity of this movie and the vision of two men that would bring about the creation of Batman the Animated Series. In 1990, the president of Warner Brothers Animation, Jean McCurdy, called a meeting and discussed some of the different properties that the company was planning on possibly using. When Bruce Timm, who was working as a writer and storyboard artist for Tiny Toons Adventures at the time, heard that Batman was a possibility, he went back to his desk and started drawing. According to the man, he worked for a few hours to come up with his own design for Batman, and he brought the designs to Jean McCurdy, who loved them. Almost at the same time, Eric Rodomsky, who worked as a background painter on Tiny Toons, had gone back to his own desk to design the look and feel of Gotham City. Jean McCurdy brought the two men together and told them to create a pilot, a minute and a half animated short that would sell the show to executives. Once the pilot was finished and shown to the executives, Bruce and Eric were given the green light to create the series and put in charge, something neither of them had ever done before. Bruce and Eric brought together a group of creators that shared their vision for The Dark Knight. The show was intended to be written as something that fans of all ages could enjoy. They would tell real stories, leaning heavily on the work of Alfred Hitchcock or film noir for inspiration. The design of the show was also super simple. Instead of the over-detailing that cartoons had become known for, the Max Flesher Superman cartoons from the 1940s were big inspiration. They developed a modernist take on the Art Deco design, making Gotham seem as if it were a modern city with the trappings of the past. They developed new ideas to show the darkness of Gotham City, drawing the animations on black paper instead of white, using the world to fill in the darkness instead of the other way around. When it came to voice casting, those that they hired became some of the most iconic versions of the characters. Batman was possibly the hardest to find, with the team listening to over 500 auditions. Eventually, Kevin Conroy came in, having never auditioned for voiceover work before. The actor knew very little of Batman, only what he had seen in Adam West's Batman. Yet after Tim had explained a little history of the character, Kevin Conroy came up with the idea of two distinct voices for Batman and Bruce Wayne. He was given the part and became what many considered to be their Batman. The role of the Joker had originally gone to Tim Curry, who had even recorded three episodes. Now, there are two different stories as to why Tim Curry was replaced as the Joker. According to the actor himself, he had come down with a terrible case of bronchitis and could no longer continue. According to the producers on the show, however, Curry's take on the character wasn't working out like they had hoped. Whatever the case, the producers received word from Mark Hamill's agents, asking if the actor could be a part of the show. Hamill himself was a huge comic book fan and wanted to be a part of this new version of Batman. Once again, Mark Hamill's take on the Joker has become so iconic that he is many people's Joker. Why don't you take your mask off and have a few laughs? <laughs> Cut the clowning, Joker. Many people point to the voice acting of why this series is so amazing. This was also achieved by having the voice actors record their lines together in the booth, a practice which was uncommon at the time. 
At the beginning, Fox ordered 65 episodes which would be contracted out to various animation studios overseas, a practice that was very common at the time. Work at the beginning was shaky, with some studios being let go due to inconsistencies in animation, another practice that had unfortunately become common. While the show proved to be incredibly popular, Fox executives began to worry that it didn't appeal to younger children, which was a key to an animated series that could also sell toys. First, as a way to rectify this, the show's name was changed from Batman the Animated Series to The Adventures of Batman and Robin. Next, the decree was sent down that every episode would feature Robin in some way. This hindered some of the more creative story ideas that the writers had. While the show is considered very dark for a children's program, one can wonder how much darker it would have gone if the writers were given complete autonomy to not have to deal with the times that it was created, where they just wanted a cartoon for kids. Still. The show featured a level of storytelling that wasn't seen in an animated series at the time. Violence and darkness were standard. Villains had real story arcs and were seen as tragic characters. This could be truly seen in the complete reimagining of Mr. Freeze. While the comics at this time had seen the character as nothing more than an ice-themed goofball, the animated series recast him as a brilliant scientist who was merely trying to find a cure for his wife, who he had locked in a frozen stasis so that her illness wouldn't kill her. He was dark, he was tragic, and he's one of my favorite versions of Mr. Freeze. He's become the standard for Mr. Freeze for just about everybody. Most people don't even realize that this origin came out of this series. The character of Harley Quinn was also introduced in this show. Another tragic character, Harleen Quinzel, was the Joker's therapist at Arkham Asylum. She would fall for the murderous clown, becoming his henchwoman and lover. She proved so popular that she began to appear in the mainstream comics. While many would point to her relationship as textbook toxic, she would eventually become her own woman, leaving an abusive relationship and starting out on her own. She has proven to be one of the most popular DC characters ever. To the point of one of their big This Is What's Happening Over The Next Year panels, they stated that the pinnacles of DC were Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Harley Quinn. She's getting a movie based entirely around her. The animated series would go on to span two animated movies. The Mask of the Phantasm would debut in theaters on Christmas Day in 1993, while Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero would come out of VHS in 1998. I remember going to the theaters to see Mask of the Phantasm, and as a child just being so excited to see Batman in the big screen, a Batman that I was enjoying, that I was watching on a weekly basis. And then Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero, even though at that point I had kind of grown beyond having actually watched a lot of cartoons, this is when I felt that cartoons were for kids and I shouldn't be watching them. He's lying, and I'm gonna find out why. While Batman the Animated Series would end its run on Fox Kids in 1995, that was not the end of the series as a whole. After leaving Fox Kids, Kids WB would begin the Superman animated series in 1996. Almost a year after the Superman show debuted, and two years after the Batman the animated series ended, the new Batman Adventures made its debut in Kids WB. This series saw the return of most of the voice cast writers and producers. The art style was made to be more in line with the Superman series, and the stories began to shift to center on Batman's friends, allies, and enemies. It was in this series that Batman and Superman met for the first time in the animated universe, meaning that the shows had at that point created a shared universe. As the new Batman adventures would end, it would give way for the Batman Beyond series, which was set within the future of an already established universe. Next would come the Justice League and Justice League Unlimited cartoons, all set within Bruce Timm's animated universe. Not only is Batman the animated series considered one of the greatest comic book adaptations of all times, it paved the way for possibly DC's greatest shared universe ever. And if you want to know what happened to the Superman shows and all of these follow-ups, well, we're going to be getting to those right here at the Comic Story and Channel. So consider subscribing to find out the next true chapter to the story, not a quick synopsis version of what happened afterwards. I hope you guys enjoyed this and continue to let me know in the comments down below what shows you want us to cover next.